Okay, today we're going to be looking at numerical data. Let's put some data up on the screen. Okay, we did a survey. We surveyed 20 people and we asked them how many cups of coffee they'd had that day. Some people had had zero cups of coffee. Some people had had one, others two, three, and four. Okay, let's say that the number of people who had zero cups of coffee was six. The number of people who had one cup of coffee was seven. The number of people who had two cups of coffee was four. And then there was two people who had three and one person had four cups of coffee. We called this kind of presentation of data a frequency distribution table. And in this particular case, the data that we've got is called ungrouped data. And what ungrouped data means is that for each of the possible scores, in this case 0, 1, 2, 3, or 4 cups of coffee, those are the possible scores, each of those scores is a group on its own. So this is one group, that's another group, that's another group. As we'll see in a moment, sometimes we can, if we've got lots and lots of possible scores, we can put them together in groups. Well, let's look at some group data. Let's say we did another survey. This time, 20 people were surveyed again, and they were asked a different question. Instead of how many cups of coffee had they had in a day, they were asked how many cups of coffee have you had this year, in an entire year. Now for a question like this, we are going to get a different set of answers. Some people who don't drink any coffee at all are going to say zero. They haven't had any cups of coffee this year. Other people might say a number like, oh, I've had probably 200 cups of coffee this year. Some other people might say, well, I've had 500 cups of coffee this year. And another person might be able to say, well, actually, if I add them all up, I've had 673 cups of coffee this year. Okay, so this time we've got a wide possible variety of answers, anywhere from zero all the way up to 673 and even beyond. So you can imagine the problem we're going to have when we try and put this data into a frequency distribution table. We have to put in all the people who had zero cups of coffee and also all the people who had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And we want to keep going and put in all the different possible scores. We want to put in the person who had 500 cups of coffee and the person who had 673 cups of coffee. But it's not realistic. It's not practical to put all of those into this table, is it? The, the table would end up stretching on to a massive distance and it would be very inconvenient. So what can we do instead? Well, as an alternative, what we can do is to put our data into groups. We can make this into grouped data. Okay, so this time each score is not going to have its own group. We're going to put them into larger accumulated scores. So what I'm doing is putting them all into groups of a hundred different scores, a hundred different possibilities. In this group are all the scores from zero all the way up to a hundred, but not including a hundred. So any scores, anyone who had zero cups of coffee, 55 cups of coffee, 67 cups of coffee, 99 cups of coffee, we're going to count that one in here. Let's say there were four people who had between zero and up to 100 cups of coffee. But then all the people who had 100 or 150 or 175 cups of coffee, we're going to count those ones in here. And let's say there were five of those. Then there were all the people who had between 200 and 300 cups of coffee. If they had 255 or 273, that's going to go in here. Let's say there were six people in that category. Okay, if someone had 300 cups of coffee, they wouldn't go in this group, they would go in this group. Okay, this group goes from 200 up to 300, but not including 300. It stops just before it gets to 300. Okay, so in this group we've got people with 350, 365, 380 cups of coffee. Let's say there were three of those. So now we've got 4, 9, 15, 16, 17, 18. And there was one in each of these remaining ones. So that's grouped data. And grouped data is very helpful whenever you've got a wide range of possible scores. 
in your data. So too many to give each score its own individual group. All right, let's put our data over to the side here for a second and talk for a second about histograms. Okay, a histogram is a way of presenting data that you might have in a frequency distribution table or some other format to present it in a graphical way with a picture, which is often a good way to understand the data, to look at it as a picture. A picture tells a thousand words, they say. Okay, to make a histogram, we need two axes, a vertical axis that goes up and down, a horizontal axis that goes left to right. Okay, we always put the frequency on the vertical axis, the one that goes up and down. We measure the frequency on that axis. On the other axis, we're going to put our various groups. So cups of coffee in this case, or a number of cups of coffee to be more precise. Okay, now on the number of cups of coffee axis, we're going to put our various groups. So the first group goes from zero up to 100. The second group goes from 100 up to 200. Then 300, 400, and all the way up to 500. Uh, if I had the opportunity to use a ruler, then I would I would do that. It's not possible in this case, though. On the frequency axis, I'm going to plot the possible frequencies. So the highest frequency in our data is 6. So I'll put that right at the top to begin with. Halfway down will be 3. And then I can break that up into 1, 2, and 4, 5. Okay, this is a rough graph, it's not, not going to be perfect, but it's pretty okay. Alright, let's start putting our data in. So in our first group, we had between 0 and 100 cups of coffee, not including 100 though. And there were 4 people who had that. So for this section here, the frequency is 4. And I'm going to mark that with a little uh, bar, or a box, a rectangle. Notice I've left a gap here, just before the first box, but from that point on there won't be any gaps in between the, the boxes that I draw, the bars. So the first group had a frequency of 4. In the second group, which was from 100 to 200, there, were, there was a frequency of 5. Five people responded that they'd had between 100 and 200 cups of coffee in that year. The next group, for 200 to 300, was 6. So this is our biggest group. There's that one. The next and the next two were only one. So one and one. Okay, so that's pretty much our histogram there. Now what's what's the purpose of doing this? Well, making this picture of the data, it gives us it gives us a kind of general overview of the shape of the data. Okay, we can see in the early responses they kind of built up gradually, they got larger and larger, and then there was a big drop off. Okay, so it gives us a way of seeing the overall pattern or the overall shape of the data set. If we had more groups, if we split these up into groups of 50, 0 to 50, 50 to 100, and so on, that would give us an even more precise breakdown of the, of the way the data changed or the way the, the way the scores played out as, uh, as all the responses were given. By choosing five groups, we've been given yeah, a rough idea of, of what happened. And it's important to remember that every histogram, just like every graph, should have labels on the axes, frequency and number of cups of coffee in this place, and it should also have a title. So I'll give this graph the title, Cups of Coffee in One Year. Okay, next we're going to put a polygon over the top of our histogram. A polygon is basically just a line graph that uh, maps the progress of the histogram. We begin the polygon, so, yeah, we begin the polygon half a bar before the first, uh, before the first part of our histogram. This is the first bar here. Half a bar before is about here. We start on the, at zero, frequency of zero. 
And then we mark in the middle of each bar up the top, we mark a data point. So I'm marking data points in the middle of each, in the top middle of each bar. And you'll see why I'm doing that in a second. Each of these data points is, is somehow representative of those bars because it's in the middle, so it kind of represents the average or the midpoint of each, of each bar. So these data points are representing each of the bars, and here's another one here. I also need one half a bar after the end of the last, uh, the last bar in our data. Okay, now once I've got my data points, then I just connect them up with straight lines. Connect the dots. So starting from the first data point, connect up to this, the, dot at the, the data point at the top of the first bar, then connect that to the second bar and so on. At the end, I'll have a polygon. That's the line graph that I've created. And if you have some way of taking away the bars like I do, then it's a lot easier to see the polygon. Okay, this polygon, this line graph, shows us the shape of our data in a arguably more precise way than the bar graph did, the histogram did. Okay, now when we're looking at histograms and polygons, we find that there are several shapes or several types of, of uh, polygons that tend to crop up again and again. Several distributions of data, we call them. Let's have a look at the most common ones. There's normal skewed, bimodal, spread, and clustered. Let's look at an example of each. Here is a normal distribution. You can see the shape of the normal distribution is kind of like a hill. It starts off gradually going up, going up, going up until it reaches a peak, and then it gradually goes down, down, down at the same rate that it went up on the first side. Okay, so that's called a normal distribution. It's very common. If you measured the heights of a lot of people, you'd find that's what the graph would look like. If you measured their weights, you'd find that's what it would look It would look something very similar to that as well. Next, we see some skewed data. So we've got two uh, different graphs this time. One is negatively skewed and one is positively skewed. We say that this one is negatively skewed because the tail is on the negative side. The tail of the data is on the negative side of the peak. On this one, we can see that the tail is on the positive side or the right hand side of the peak. So we call this one positively skewed data. The tail is on the positive side. It looks in some ways similar to a normal distribution, but clearly it's been biased in some way. Something's pushed some of the data to one side or the other side. With bimodal data, we can see that, again, it's kind of, you can see the relation to the normal distribution, but this time, instead of going gradually up to a single peak, it goes, it goes gradually up to one peak, then drops down, and then it has another peak before it drops down again. So, it's as if in this case, there were two peaks. We call this bimodal. Next, we have uh, distribution of data that we call spread. In this case, most of the data is, uh, most of the different uh, groups have a very similar frequency. So there's an even spread of data. There isn't a, there isn't a great uh, difference between the different groups in their school, in their frequencies. And finally, we have clustered data, which is kind of the opposite of spread data. Whereas spread data, there's a very even uh, up frequency across all the different scores. With clustered, there tends to be some very high scores and some very low on either side. So it's not a gradual rising and falling like in the normal distribution. We've got uh, these scores with very low frequencies, then all of a sudden very high frequencies and then very low frequencies again. So the clustered distribution is the opposite of the spread distribution. Okay, and here's a nice little summary of the data so you can pause it and write it down. Thanks for listening.